welcome to Accepted Secrets of New York City School Admissions with Alina Adams. She is savant extraordinaire <laughs> on getting into kindergarten. In fact, she's written the ebook, Getting into New York City Kindergarten. Hi, Alina. Hi, Vicki. Oh, I'm Victoria Chapman. <laughs> and um, we have been talking about gifted and talented um, public school programs, Hunter College Elementary, and private schools, and prepping your children for tests to get in the above. But today we're going to talk about timing on a couple of different levels. First off, what if you want to accelerate your child? Under what conditions should a parent consider acceleration? Well, here's the first thing to know about acceleration in New York City. It is almost impossible to get it done in a New York City public schools. I never say never about anything in New York City because the other side of it is you can have anything you want in New York City. The question is how badly do you want it? Mm. But as a rule, it is almost impossible to accelerate your child a grade in New York City. That said, I have heard of some charter schools accelerating children, and we'll talk about charter schools at a later segment. But if you're just talking about public school accelerating a child, is very difficult regardless of whether they're in kindergarten or whether they're in high school. Now, one thing that parents can do is they can nurture their child's interest outside of school. There are programs like Center for Talented Youth okay. and Duke. Now, usually these are also test-based programs. Children usually take a standardized test that's at a higher level than their grade. So if they're in fourth grade, they might take the SCAT test for sixth, seventh, and eighth grade. If they're in sixth, seventh, and eighth grade, they might take the SAT and that sort of thing. So you're saying they can kind of test out or test up? They can test up, but this isn't for school. This is for courses that you can take outside of school. Mm -hmm. And it's as it is for gifted and talented youth. It's the John Hopkins Center for Gifted and Talented Youth. So there are things that children can pursue outside of school. And here's something really important to remember also. If your child is truly passionate about a subject, if your child is a master of a subject, odds are they're going to be ahead of what any school could teach because no school, even if it's a school like Hunter or Anderson or Nest or another gifted school, no school can accommodate the interests of every single child. That's just impossible. So the best way to think about getting your child into a program that's comparable at their level for their interest is to do it outside of school. Okay, but if you, let's say your child is very interested and they are performing in programs above their grade level, at what point, if at all, will the schools allow their performance to match their grade level? Won't they be bored in a, in a lesser grade? That's really not the public school's concern. The public school's concern is that your child does well on a standardized test. And if your child is bored and then comes in and whips out a standardized test, the school's not really going to worry about their mental health. Okay, but <laughs> I'm thinking about their education and their advancement. <laughs> well, that's that's a whole other <laughs> issue. And very, what is it, the quote from Mark Twain, never let school get in the way of your education? Okay. So there's that. I mean, children can apply to gifted and talented programs outside of the kindergarten level. They can take tests in uh, to go into gifted first grade, gifted second grade, gifted third grade. They can apply to gifted middle schools. They can certainly apply to specialized high schools, which are often very good for gifted children. But that's not so much acceleration as it is moving from a general ed curriculum into a gifted one. One other quick question, and then we're going to move on to holding back. What about if a child takes uh, summer classes advanced ahead that they know are part of their curriculum? Personally, I did that in, in high school. But it wasn't in New York City. No, it was not. It was in Philadelphia. <laughs> no. In New York City, that is also a very, very difficult process. Some kids take college classes during the summer, but to get credit for that, it's possible. But again, how badly do you want it? Okay, very interesting. Okay, now let's talk about holding the child back. What should a parent consider about holding the child back and when and why? Well, one thing to remember is that in New York City, the age cutoffs for public school are the calendar year when your child turns five. So it doesn't matter if your child was born January 1st or December 31st, they're going to need to start kindergarten the calendar year they turn five, which means children with birthdays in late September, October, November, December will be starting kindergarten before they turn five years old. Some parents don't want that. They believe their children are too young. 
there are various ways to get around that. The most basic way is because cutoffs are different in private schools. Private schools usually have a September 1st cutoff, if not earlier. Parents might send their child to private kindergarten and then a few grades and then move them to public school because at that point, the public schools will honor the grade, not the age. Another option that I've known parents have done is they have not registered their child for kindergarten at the beginning of September, but waited until the end of May to bring their child into kindergarten and then say, well, clearly this child is not ready to be promoted to first grade at principal's discretion. Could the child be quote unquote held back? Although it isn't really a case of being held back since they were never in kindergarten to begin with. But that's something that parents have done to get their child to start kindergarten when they are older. Another thing that parents have done is moved out of New York City. I've known people who have gone to New Jersey where the cutoff is October 1st mm -hmm. and had their child do a year of public school in New Jersey and then moved back because, once again, they will honor the grade, not the age, if you do that. Now, why might a parent want to hold their child back? Or the school? Well, if a school wants to hold a child back, that's different. The school usually does it at their discretion if they don't think the child is either emotionally or academically ready to proceed. A parent will do it for the same reasons, but the parent is using their own judgment. Very often, a parent will consider the fact that their child is a December baby and they're going to be four years old and they don't want to be the youngest, the smallest, the most immature child in their class. They think it will be better for their child to be on the older side. So for developmental reasons, parents might want to hold their child back. Um, now, are there benefits? I'm going to use a personal experience again. Um, I have family members. One was held back, <laughs> the other was accelerated. Boys, two years apart in age, exact same grade. That must have been a happy experience for everyone involved. Exactly. <laughs> Competit competition, somebody feeling a little full of themselves about somebody who's feeling a little less, you know, or, or put down. So what are some of the benefits of being held back versus some of the drawbacks? Well, for as an example, also a personal example, my oldest son was the second youngest in his class, and it was really noticeable in kindergarten, first and second grade, where you could clearly see, even though he was doing fine academically, he could do the work, that he was younger, he's also on the small side, he was much less mature than the other boys. Then around third, fourth, fifth, sixth grade, it evens out, and you couldn't really tell, but in seventh and eighth grade, suddenly that became very noticeable. Again, he had no trouble academically. He was doing fine, but at one point, there were two boys in his eighth grade class who were over six feet tall. He stood between them at one assembly. He looked like he was their snack. The fact is, <laughs> boys develop at such different rates that if you were a year younger than the other boys in your class, it's going to be noticeable both physically and in your emotional maturity. So there are social factors as well as academic factors. In some ways, parents are even much more concerned about social factors than academic ones. Academically, they've actually shown for some children who are the youngest in their class, it's actually a benefit because the fact is you're doing accelerated work. You've kind of accelerated yourself. Yes. If you're a full year younger, then you're being forced to perform academically at a level of someone who's a year older. Academically, it's actually good for you. But as with anything else, I can find you a study that backs up whatever you believe. If you believe holding a child back is good for them, I can find you plenty of studies. And in my book, I have several studies. And if you believe holding a child back is bad for them, I can find you plenty of studies. And in my book, there's links to those studies, too. Okay. Um, hmm. And like you said, there's anecdotal evidence on both sides. Well, it's even, it's even research. I mean, what, yes. yeah, back to Mark Twain, lies, damn lies, and statistics. You can find stats that will back up whatever you want. Hi, and welcome back to Accepted, Secrets of New York City School Admissions. Of course, I'm here with Alina Adams, author of the book Getting into New York City Kindergarten. And we are talking about timeline. It's about time. <laughs> it's October. You think you have a year ahead of you? Not you do, <laughs> but there's a lot that needs to be done in that year. Okay, Alina, start us off. It's October 2015 and the race is on. What should parents be doing now to get their children across that finish line? 
Well, first, I'd like to stress that optimally, you should have started 18 months before your child starts kindergarten, which means you really should have started last May, taking tours of schools that you were interested, deciding which tests your child wanted to take, deciding if you wanted to prep your child for tests. Last week, we talked about test prep and ways that you can prep your child. The summer is usually a good time to do that. But right now, it's October. So if you're a parent who's going to be applying in a few years, remember, you really should be starting in May. If you're a parent who's applying right now, here's everything you should be doing starting now and going up through September 2016. All right, it's October. That means hopefully you've already gotten your Hunter College application, which went online in the middle of August, and you've gotten all the private school applications that you're interested in. Most of them went online after Labor Day. Something important to remember about private school applications is that some schools will interview everyone who expresses interest. Some schools will only send out a finite number of applications. So if there's a school that you absolutely want your child to apply to, make sure that you ask for that application as early as possible. Now, also in October, the gifted and talented request for testing forms have become available. That means if you want your child to be tested for public school gifted and talented, and a few weeks ago we spoke about public school gifted and talented programs and what those are and what score your child needs to get, but before any of that happens, you must sign your child up to take the test. It is called a request for testing form. There's a link to it in my book, and that is out right now, October. Okay, November. In November, Hunter College uh, Elementary School applications are due, which means that if you are applying your child to Hunter College Elementary, you must have filled your paperwork in by November. The same goes for gifted and talented requests for testing forms. Those will also be due in November. December. December, your private school applications are due. Now, schools may continue interviewing children and parents past the deadline. And in fact, when I spoke to an admissions officer, she mentions that they tried to interview the older children earlier in the season and the younger the child, the later in the season, they tend to interview them because they want the child to present themselves in the best possible light. But December is when your applications are due. And also in December, if you're interested in charter schools, which we'll be talking about next week, they're common on Online charter school application will also become available. Okay, um, just a little background. You mentioned interviews. Again, some reviews or tips for interviewing. There's a couple of things you should do when you're being interviewed by a private school. For one thing, don't give them canned answers. Really tailor your answers to the school because the fact of the matter is you should be buying what the school is selling or else even if you get in, If you're not happy with what they teach, you're not going to be happy, your child's not going to be happy, the school's not going to be happy. So answer the questions honestly, but it's sort of like Oprah says, you know, when about be yourself, be your best self. In this case, talk about the things about the school that truly appeal to you. Talk about why the school is a good fit for you, and also talk about why you are a good fit for the school. Because remember, the person who's sitting across from you is trying to decide, is this a family that I want to spend? spend the next six years of my life, the next nine years of my life, the next 13 years of my life dealing with. Private schools are very much interested in accepting families because as my husband, the teacher, likes to say, remember, they're not rejecting your child, they're rejecting you. Okay. (laughs) We're heading into January. New year. All right. January is what they call the Hunter College Elementary School second round interviews. Now, we spoke about Hunter College previously in an earlier podcast. They take the top 250 highest scoring children on their test and they bring them in into sort of mock playrooms play groups where they are observed by people, sort of like rats in a cage because it is a lab school, but very cute rats. And that is the second round interviews. They're usually held around Martin Luther King Day's birthday. So if you are planning a vacation, don't do anything where you can't get a refund if you think your child's going to have a shot at the second round. Also in January, kids will start taking the public school gifted and talented test. Remember the ones that you registered for in October? They're going to take them in January. In the past, the tests were given in January and February. This year, according to the latest release dates, they are only going to happen in January. So only four weekends in January. Make sure that you get a prime spot for your child. And the final thing is Kindergarten Connect 
which is the form on which you rank your general education public school choices. Again, we talked about that in an earlier podcast about general education options. Kindergarten Connect opens for registrations. Now, while placement is not first come, first served, it doesn't matter if you're the first person to register at a particular neighborhood school. It still goes to lottery if the school is full. I do recommend that you do it as early as possible simply so that you don't lose your mind. But know that when you file the application, you can go back and change your choices. So if a week later you go, no, I want to reverse and put PS199 ahead of PS87, you can do that up until the closing date. Okay. Now you mentioned the secondary interviews for private school in January. The secondary interviews are for Hunter College Elementary. For Hunter College. Private, co- private schools will keep doing interviews throughout the year. Okay. Are there anything to keep in mind for second interviews? And what about when you're touring schools? Well, when you're touring schools, the most important thing that I found out, and it took me three children to figure this out, or at least to have it explained to me, is that when you're taking a tour, the person leading the tour reports everything that you say back to the admissions person. So when you're on the tour, also be on your best behavior, because again, they're not just watching your child, they're watching you. Okay, and um, also, well, what should you look for? What you should look for in a tour is a couple of things. One is try to get a tour that happens when the school is open. Some people will do tours in the evenings, but then you're really touring a blank building. Um, Try to tour during the day when the children are there and see, are the kids engaged? Are they leaping out of their seats with enthusiasm, with their hands up in the air, wanting to answer the question? See how the teacher interacts with the kids. Another thing to do, and this you can do whether you're touring during the day or in the evening, is read the work on the walls. Because the work that's been put on the walls means this is work that the school feels is exemplary and what they feel exemplifies what they're about. I'll give you an example. When we toured a school a few years ago for our older son, there was an essay hanging on the wall that read, World War II began in 1943. No, it did not. But that told me that this was something that the school put up on the wall. I don't know for what reason. To be honest, I didn't read beyond the first paragraph. So maybe the most brilliant essay ever written in the history of fourth grade about World War II. But that turned me off. But it showed that the school, for whatever reason, put up that work on the wall. So look at what kind of work is up, and that will tell you what the school's about. And quickly, before we move on with the timeline, you mentioned something about touring schools that you think you might not be interested in? One of the things is I suggest to everyone is when you are touring schools, tour at least one school that you're absolutely sure you have no interest in. If you're absolutely sure you have no interest in a single sex school, go ahead and look at one anyway. If you're absolutely sure you have no interest in a progressive school, go ahead and look at one anyway. Because the fact is, You might change your mind, and this might be with schools that you're absolutely sure you do want. I've known many people who have been absolutely sure that they want a traditional school, and they go in there, and they walk out going, oh, my God, it's a Hitler's Youth Rally. Or people who are absolutely sure that they want a progressive school, and they walk out thinking, oh, my God, it's Lord of the Flies. So the fact of the matter is do not assume you know what you want. Don't listen to anybody else tell you what you want, but go in and absolutely positively see for yourself. Great. Still more on the timeline. When we return, we'll look at February on. We'll be right back. Hi there, and welcome back to Accepted. We're talking timeline. We've just gone October through January. We're heading headlong for September 2016, February. Elena, what to look for? Well, in February is when private schools and Hunter College Elementary notify acceptance. This will be the only time during this entire process where the timeline actually works in your favor. Because here's the thing. If you get accepted into a private school, you have one week to either accept or decline the school placement. You will then sign a contract. You will be asked for a deposit. If a few months down the line, you decide that you do not want to send your child to this private school and you want to send them somewhere else, some schools may return your deposit, some schools may keep just your deposit, and some schools may say that you still owe them a year's worth of tuition because the fact of the matter is you signed a legal contract. So in February, if you are getting accepted into a private school, be sure that this is the school you want before you sign the contract or be prepared to lose your deposit. 
Now, what if your child gets accepted in more than one school? If your child gets accepted into more than one school, more than one private school, you will get a chance to retour. Most schools will offer another tour. And then by the end of that week, you have to notify which school you're accepting and which schools you are declining. Do be aware that in the past, you could not sign a contract with a private school and remain on the wait list of other private schools. But that rule has since been changed. And you can sign a contract with a private school and remain on the wait list of other private schools. But once again, be advised that if you then get into that private school and forfeit your spot at the first school, you may lose your deposit or up to a year's worth of tuition. Another thing that happens in February is Kindergarten Connect applications are due. So by February, you should have figured out and ranked a list of your general education public school choices. Okay. Now, according to your timeline, we jump from February to April. March is kind of a dead month, but that's been in the past. This year, already some deadlines have been changed. For instance, um, public school G&T testing will only be in January now. The request for testing forms are going to be due in early November. So the fact is, as I always say, just because something is true about New York City school admissions today does not mean it will be true tomorrow. As of now, not much happens in March, but who knows? It could all be different come March 2016. Is there a good way to be using your time in March to make it still productive? Well, you could be panicking. That's always good. <laughs> if you're a religious person, you could be praying. Working wait lists? For private schools, yes. You can definitely be working the wait list in private school because by then the schools will know which schools have accepted, which students have accepted them and which students have turned them down. So, yes, you could work a private school wait list in March and see how that goes. In April, you will receive your child's gifted and talented scores, and you will rank your gifted and talented school choices. This will be just like on Kinder, Kindergarten Connect. Genuinely rank the schools in the order that you prefer because you will be given your top available choice. And once you have been given it, you then can't go back and go, no, I changed my mind. So please think and then rank the schools according to your preference. You will also find out where your child got into a general education public school, and you will find out where your child got into a charter school if you applied one. Remember, if for general education, if you did not get your first choice, if you say got your fifth choice, you are automatically waitlisted for all the schools ahead of it, which means both the first, second, third, and fourth schools that you put down on the list. Okay, May. In May, you will find out where your child got into a gifted and talented, if they got into a gifted and talented, and you have to, by June, accept or reject that placement. Do keep in mind that in the past, parents have been able to register at one private school, at one gifted and talented school, at one general ed school, and at one charter school with really no repercussions except for the private school where you actually had to put money down. But the right hand had no idea what the left hand was doing, so you could theoretically be holding three um, different placements. Now, at least for this past year, supposedly a new algorithm has gone into place where every subsequent registration nullifies everything that went before it. So don't think you can register in three different schools and then spend all summer trying to decide which one you're going to send your child to. Whichever the last school that you registered at was, that is the school that will have your current registration. All the other ones will be voided. Even across the different types of schools? Well, except for private school, which, as I said, is yes. separate. The fact is, yes, supposedly, according to this new algorithm, they just rolled it out this year, so I haven't gotten confirmation of how well it worked, is that whether you register at a general ed public school, a gifted and talented public school, or a charter school, Whichever one was your last registration is the one that's going to be valid. Everything else will be voided. Wow. Okay. And um, the wait list. Now the fun starts because now the wait lists really start moving. The fact of the matter is once gifted and talented placements are out, that's when it's anybody's ballgame because the kids who got into gifted and talented are dropping a spot in a general ed school, which will be filled by kids who maybe are dropping a spot in a charter school, which may be filled with kids who are maybe dropping a spot in a private school, which will then open up a spot in another private school, which will then open up a spot and it goes round and round and round. And the fact is the registration doesn't officially close until October 21st. At least that's been the date in the past few years. So in theory, it could be September and you could still be working a wait list to get your kid into the school of your choice. So if you 
September 2016 rolls around, you put your child in school someplace, but you still work on wait lists elsewhere? You could be because the fact of the matter is maybe somebody didn't show up and a place opened up. I've even known parents who physically shown up on the first day of school at the school they preferred and they said someone's not going to show up and when that spot becomes available, I'm getting that spot. How do you do that and still have your child elsewhere in the meantime? (laughs) You can just show up by yourself. And kind of hang around, smile politely at the principal. Hello, and any empty spots? You know, got anything good? Got anything in the back? You know, got any good kindergarten spots in the back that you could bring out a little ding? How about the floor bottle? Okay. So, yes, you can still work there. Just remember, just because it's September doesn't mean the process is over. You can still keep trying. Okay, so that process is now over or winding down for those entering kindergarten. But you're saying in May, things should be heating up. Exactly. The fact of the matter is, if you think you have a year because your child is starting pre-K in September of 2016, you really don't. You should have started already your processes the May before. Okay, so we'll have to revisit that a little (laughs) later on in the year. Perhaps in May. Okay, so a lot of information, of course. We've given it here, but it's in your book. It is in my book and the links to all of the forms that I mentioned, Kindergarten Connect, Request for Testing Form, Common App for Charter Schools, all of those links are in the book. And you've mentioned sometimes that rules change midstream. They do. And in fact, this past year, the rules for how you apply to do language changed midstream. Then just recently, they put out the fact that gifted and talented testing will only be in January this year. So at the end of my book, there is a mailing list that you can subscribe to where I will send out to you every time there is a change. So you can be up to the minute informed. Sam, sounds like you've covered all the bases. And if people want to hear me talk some more, I also do free workshops throughout New York City, and you can find out where and register on my website at www.alinaadams.com. Excellent. Okay, um, before we wrap up, I've got a question for you from a parent. What if I want to transfer my child after kindergarten? You can It isn't easy, and as I always say, this is New York. You can have anything you want. The question is, how badly do you want it? The fact of the matter is, once you accept a placement in kindergarten, you are not locked in for it being, you know, a K-5 to school or a K-6 to school or a K-8 to school or a K-12. to You can move your child. A lot of movement goes on, especially around third or fourth grade, where you suddenly find out that the cute little four-year-old that you thought needed something is actually a kind of an angsty tween who might need something else. Now, is it easy to transfer a child from one public school to another? It's not. But is it possible? Absolutely. The same goes with private schools. There's usually attrition. There's usually a spot or two open. It's a little trickier with charter schools. Some of them don't take kids after a certain grade. Hunter College Elementary doesn't take kids after second grade until their next entry point, which is high school. But the fact of the matter is you can move your child from school to school. Kindergarten is not your only entry point and you are not trapped for the duration of the room. Okay. A lot of information, a lot to keep up with. Clearly, if you want to track it, the book is probably the best way. (laughs) And then the newsletter is the second best. Um, Anything else you want to add? I'd love to meet you at my workshops. Okay, great. Well, that's it for today. Uh, When we next see you, we're going to look at charter schools. Thanks so much for joining us.